نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يحسهما فلا يذر إلا نفسه فقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقضة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حق مزدنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وزدنا استنابا اللهم الحمني رشدي وعزني من شر نفسي آمين يا رب العالمين Today the topic I'll be talking about is extremely important. Listen to what I'm saying very carefully, brothers and sisters. Let me start by the definition of what is wealth. What is money? What is wealth in Islam? What is mal? You'll see how this topic affects your future and your future planning of how you're going to plan your future as a Muslim and how we may have to plan our future as a community. Mal, the word mal, comes from mala yumil. We all know the word mal means wealth. But the word mal comes from yamilu. Mala yumilu, meaning that towards which your heart is inclined. If the people's heart is inclined towards something, it means it has value. Right? Gold, for example, people's hearts are inclined towards gold. So gold has value because the hearts are inclined to it. This is what the word mal means. Mal means to be inclined towards something. Something is an asset if people's hearts are inclined towards something. You have something like salt. People need salt. Their hearts are inclined towards salt because it's a need. So it becomes like an asset. It becomes mal. Now, this definition, now that I've clarified the meaning of definition of mal, You'll see the word mal has to do with the human heart and human psyche and human inclinations towards something which gives it value. Now, <coughs> so if, like for example, people's hearts are not necessarily inclined towards, let's say sand for example. If I give you a bunch of sand and give it to you and you're going to say, it has no value for me, I can't do anything with this. So your heart, it has, no, it has no value, it's sand, it's dust. So, what is the history of modern currency? It's a little bit important. Why is this topic important? You know, every year, some people come to me and they ask me that zakat al fitr I want to give it in food instead of cash. You probably, many of you have probably heard this argument also. It's not this issue that is really the issue. Just like zakat al fitr in the days of the Prophet was being given in the, in the form of food, just like this for almost 1,300 years, zakat was given in gold and silver. There was no cash, which in the Ottoman Empire got the terminology that was made for understanding cash was the word falus. So our, the books of fiqh, the books of Islamic law, they use the word falus for cash. <coughs> I have mentioned two points so far. <coughs> Number one, the meaning of mal. Mal is something to which the hearts are inclined towards. Number two, that in the time of the Prophet and in the Islamic state, in the Khilafah, the currency by which people gave zakat was always gold and silver. Now, what is a short history of money, and particularly paper money, is very important. Because this is a very important topic for which Muslims have to contemplate. In the olden days, if I had salt and you had fur, or if I had salt and you had sugar, we can exchange it. It's called bartering. No problem. Then, after that developed coins of gold and silver. 
One person came along and said, you know, why are you going to carry like a hundred thousand coins or a thousand coins? Why don't you deposit it in my bank? And this is now the beginning of the modern age. Why don't you deposit the coins in my bank and I'll give you a certificate that you have a thousand coins. Or you have, I'll give you a certificate you have a hundred thousand coins. No need to carry it around, it's a security risk. We will protect your money. Then the banker thought, you know what, I have a brilliant idea. I'm going to take this money from him and give him the certificate. He has 100,000 dinars, for example. But I'm going to take that money and give it and lend it to somebody else. So he lends it to somebody else so he can make profit for the bank. So this was continuing for almost 200 years. Then in 1967, and then finally in 1973, because after the depression, after the depression, when the economy had fallen, the US government decided that we do not want our currency, the, the paper money, that was backed, backed by gold. We do not want it to be backed by gold anymore. We're simply going to print more paper money as we need it. So in 1973, let me just give you the reference here uh, so that everybody is clear in following my argument. When the United States stopped selling gold to foreign official holders of dollar at the rate of $36 an ounce, that was for gold. In 1971, it brought the gold exchange standard to the end. In 1973, the United States officially ended its adherence to the gold standard. Many other industrialized nations also switched from a switch of fixed exchange rates, which was gold and silvers, to a system of floating rates. In August 1974, President Ford repealed the prohibition on publics owning gold or engaging in gold transactions. So no longer was it allowed that I can go to a store and say, hey, I'll give you an ounce of gold, can you give me this car? Or I'll give you this much gold and you give me a car. The government made it mandatory that the exchange can only be done in paper currency. President Hoover on June 5, 1933 provided the obligations payable in gold or a specific coin, go, coin or currency on contrary to public... I won't go into this right now. Uh, about, But the point was that gold, the dollar being backed by gold ended in 1973. Prohibition, it was prohibited to tran make transactions in gold. You had to make transactions in dollars. Now, why is this important? for a Muslim to know, just so that we're clear. The Islamic standard of currency that the Prophet gave us and the Quran gave us was gold and silver. And if you want to know, I'm going to talk about what's happening right now with this issue, but I want, I'm want i talking about this from the perspective of even we should know what money is in Islam. Money in Islam is gold and silver at, it, in its, I mean, uh, at its essence. You can also do bartering. In Islam, there's nothing wrong if I go to a barber shop and say, look, man, I don't have $10 to get a haircut. But will you accept these three books I've written? And that would be considered a completely legitimate transaction. So, for example, a scholar of Islam in the time where they didn't have printing press and he went to the barber and he said, that look, I don't have money, I, but I have knowledge. I'll, I'll write a book for, of a hundred hadiths for you. Will you accept this as a, as a fair exchange of value? Now remember, what is the meaning of wealth in Islam? Mala yuminu. Mala yuminu is that which towards your heart inclines. If your heart inclines towards something, like a book of hadiths that this scholar has written, it means it has value. It means that it would be a fair, fair exchange for the barber to cut your hair in exchange for a book of Hadith, because that book of Hadith has value. Now, 
There is a book, a very good, interesting book on the psychology of finance that I want to share with you so that you really understand this. And what Muslims as a whole, we need to start thinking about as a community because we have some very hard decisions to make probably in the next 50 to 100 years. So let me take you back to the, in the 1960s, there was the stock exchange. Believe it or not, they had stock exchange in the 1960s, in the, not 1960s, in the 1600s. Stock exchange started in Europe about 400 years ago. What happened? There was a beautiful flower. This event is called tulip, tulip mania. There was a beautiful flower in Denmark. I'll just read this. Tulip mania was a period in Dutch golden age during which the contract prices for the bulbs, meaning the plants, and recently in introduced tulip reached to extra extraordinarily high levels that suddenly collapsed. So there was this flower. It had so much value. Like, for example, it's the human heart that gives things value. Like, for example, iPod. Why do we like it? It's just our, it is the human consciousness, the human beings that say, oh, this has this value. There was a flower for which people were going crazy. People were selling their houses to buy this tulip. There were people buying, rich people selling all of their assets to buy these tulips. Then what happened? Then in the 1930s, I mean 1630s, people realized, wait, what are we doing? It is just a flower. It makes no sense to give value to a flower that you're selling your houses and selling all your assets just to buy a flower. So when they Realize, what are we doing? We're buying a flower. Because remember, it's, it's just like how we are crazy about gadgets today, in, a min, in many ways. Only to realize maybe many years later, wait, what were we doing? Why were we spending so much money on this? This is just this. So that tulip, people started realizing, wait, this is just a flower. We sold our houses and our assets for what? And all of a sudden, the tulip collapsed, and many of the uh, elite people, they lost all their assets and all their wealth and all their belongings because they had bought into the, in, they, they went for this tulip, tulip mania. Now, how does this relate to the definition of mad and the issues surrounding it? Gold and silver have intrinsic value. Gold and silver have, their value is not as fluctuating like a tulip. The value of gold and silver does not fluctuate the way a tulip would fluctuate. And in the end of the day, the value of paper that is printed, because paper money itself is not intri has intri no intrinsic value. Right? If I take a gold and go back in history 400 years, it still has value. If I take gold and go 400 years ahead in, in history, if I was have able to time travel and I use that gold, gold still has value. If I take paper money back 400 years and I give it to somebody, here is a dollar or here is five dollars or here is a hundred dollars or here is a thousand dollars, that paper money has no value for the people 400 years ago. It is not intrinsic, has no intrinsic value. And if I go maybe a thousand year ahead, the same thing may be applicable. Now, somebody may be thinking, why is Sheikh Umar talking about this? But this is an extremely important subject, not only from the perspective that the Islamic State, the Baytul Mal, would collect zakat on something that is either gold or silver or backed by gold and silver. So there's nothing wrong with having actually this paper money before it was paper money. 
was a certificate. You know, a certificate that you do own X amount of funds or X amount of gold. It would be a certification that yes, we verify and give testimony that you own this much assets. So when he would go to the store, he doesn't have to carry the gold. He has a certificate that says you go to the bank and and then uh, make the get the money from the bank. And then they would issue the guy a new certificate based upon how much the money had decreased. Now, this is important because the Prophet said that there will come a time, even though gold and silver was being used in the time of the Prophet, intrinsic valued money was being used in the time of the Prophet. I mean, I don't have time right now to go into actually the benefits of gold and silver and how it helps uh, the, the, the very fact that it, it is intrinsically valued. For example, uh, the value of gold doesn't change, but the value, let's say, of milk will change. So what you're able to buy with gold, you're actually able to... I won't go into this right now, but also keep this in mind. This is a very important point. When the economies go down, metals go up. When the economies go down, He's an investor, he knows. When the economies go down, metals go up. Why? Because whenever there is a fear that the economy is in trouble, people look towards something intrinsic in value. When the economy is going down, people look for something intrinsic in value. It is extremely important that Muslims, please come forward. about that they from the assets that you have from the savings that you have that an X amount should be gold and silver and something that has intrinsic value is not just paper money because if the people realize that paper money is just paper you print on it a hundred dollars, but it's just in the end of the day, it has no intrinsic value. If you have two ounces of gold, it has its intrinsic value. It cannot be changed, cannot be made more, cannot be made less. But a hundred dollar piece of paper is exactly that, just a hundred dollar piece of paper. And as long as we believe that it has this value, because what is value? What is mad? Mad is what the heart inclines to. As long as you give that money that value, it has that value. But it may be like the tulip mania, where people one day wake up and realize, wait, do you know what happened in Germany? The bucket in which, the bucket in which they were putting cash in, you know, if you have a whole bucket and you're driving the cash, when the, when the inflation happened in Germany, and when the inflation happened in Russia, when the, uh, I won't, won't talk about Russia right now, but when the inflation happened in Germany, people were able to put loads of money in a bucket. The bucket would be of more value than the paper money. It's already happened in history that people realized, wait, paper money is just that. It's just paper. And in those days, paper money was backed by gold. But then, because of other reasons, interest rates and so on and so forth, the inflate, and things went out of proportion. So today's paper money is even more problematic from an Islamic point of view as a wealth. Because in reality, paper money is exactly that. It's just paper. So every Muslim family should think that how they will allocate their own personal finances and how they will allocate their own personal assets. It's very important for Muslims that are well to do that they think about what percentage, 10%, 15%. I can give you not only individuals that are rich in, in the world today, the super class, which is about 2,000 families, the super class 
how much gold they own, how much gold countries like China are buying right now, how much gold corporations are now investing in. Because they realize that if something happens, they need a backup plan. And Muslims also need a backup plan. We need to have a portion. You need to, as Muslims, need to have a portion of your assets in gold and silver. And the Prophet said, وسلم, in a time they were bartering in gold and silver, the Prophet said, there will come a time where nothing will have any value except gold and silver. Meaning, the economy will collapse, there will be some economies that may collapse, but the only thing that will have value, like if you were in Germany and you had your cash, and you went to the store with the cash, the person doesn't care about your cash anymore. And economies are very delicate, especially when economies are, have an economic system that is, you can say, somewhat artificial. Now, I will talk about another issue, inshallah, after uh, the second khutbah. And then uh, we will, inshallah, uh, I will have some announcements to make. And then there is, uh, I think some brothers will be making an announcement. So, أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَاءَلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمِينَ Please come forward. Please come forward. So I was saying that now countries like Russia, countries like China, other countries that feel kind of left out from the clubs of the bigger countries, those that are smart are buying more and more gold. Anybody who has a basic knowledge of economics knows that we live in a very delicate economic system. And so, let me just review one thing, because even Islamically, by the way, when this happened, the question came up when paper money was made, for example, for almost 200 years, scholars were arguing whether if paper money has a legal Islamic value or not. So, for example, uh, you all may know uh, Mufti Mahmoud, uh, 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 the one, the, the Mufti, Mah uh, Mufti Muhammad Shafi Rahmatullah Mufti Muhammad Shafi Rahmatullah who is Mawlana Taqi Usman's father. Mawlana Taqi Usman believes that paper money is actual money. But his father, he believed that paper money is not real money, but you still have to give zakat on paper money because it's the only way to reach the objectives of zakat. Meaning the only way you can reach the objectives of zakat is by using paper money because it has value within that system. But it is in fact not paper money, but for the purposes of meeting the purpose of zakat it is used. It needs to be given zakat out of. But Mawana Taqyusmani believes that now paper money has real value. So please come forward. Please come forward. Everybody please move forward. One step forward. Any sheets we can put outside? Any sheets we can put outside? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> if if maybe one brother can take the responsibility, if you go into the building.
when you go into the building, there's a place where there's prayer rugs. You can use those prayer rugs. Okay, Bismillah, Abuna, Abuna, So I'm just saying, let me just wrap up because time is running out and we have, and please, I want everybody to stay till everything is done today. It's a holiday, <coughs> no one needs to go. I mean, you're not in a hurry like normally. So just stay put because we have uh, a brother who is going to be asking for funds. And so, inshallah, if you support them. And then also, I believe, um, uh, are both of them or just one? Just one? Okay. So, uh, and as I mentioned, that zakat has, uh, it's not just, uh, it has its masrif, or what the Imam Shafi'i calls in, in, in the, uh, in, uh, in, in its categories, you can say, the uh, masrif is the Qatqi term. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that Muslims need to give zakat on gold and silver, that's understood. And by the way, about zakat, I want to make one thing clear. I'm going to come back to this issue. Maybe I might talk about it. If I get the feedback from people that are interested in this topic, I might talk about it in more detail tonight from 9.45 onwards uh, if people are interested in this topic because it is a very fascinating topic. But there is, there, you know, Muslims have been dealing with the issue of cash and what is its value, but there is a consensus. So you can't say, oh, since paper money is just paper and it has no value, therefore I'm not going to give zakat on it. You can't do that because it's the only way to reach the objectives of zakat even though uh, at least I feel and many scholars feel that paper money is just exactly that is paper. Uh, that means that you as a Muslim have to decide what you're going to do with your assets. I recommend that you know instead of just building models of, of just always talking about loans, how we can get loans because we need to think about models of how the Islamic Khilafah will look like instead of thinking of models of this loan which is just basically for profit building purposes. We need to think about how an Islamic economic system will look like in its total. Because no matter how, it's like you can't put a, a, a Hewlett Packard uh, a, a PC part in let's say uh, in, a, um, in an IBM computer, right? I mean you can't just say okay this is a model of loaning and then that will work holistically. It doesn't work like that. So we need to think of holistic systems when we think about things Islamically. And we need to think about also that how can we take the wealth and the assets of the Muslims? Because zakat is, the, the basis of zakat is on the basis of how we could best use our assets. Right? So how can we as Muslims and Muslim economists need to come together and decide that what would be a good uh, way of saving using gold and sil silver and what are our options for that? And anyway, there's, I don't want to go into the details of that. Uh, my time is up. I want to mention one thing about zakat. I'm going to give you one thing that makes giving zakat easy. I'm going to talk about a few aspects of zakat that, will, uh, that are a continuation from my khutbah last week. Number one, zakat. Now, after having said this, now I'm saying Zakat is due on cash. Number two, zakat is due on gold. Number three, zakat is due on silver. And number four, so there are four categories of zakat in which money has to be given. And zakat has to be given in anything that is intended to, that for which you are going to do, you are intending to sell in tijawa. So for example, if you have a rental property and you're renting, your zakat will be done on the income that you get from the rental property. If you are a real estate agent and you're selling the actual land, right? and let's say if you own the land, and you're selling the land, the zakat will be due on the land, the, the, the value of the land itself. Now, about jewelry, there is a difference of opinion between the mazahibs on this. If the female is wearing jewelry, is there zakat do on it or not do on it? There's a different opinion. Imam Abu Hanifa says that as if she reaches the nisab, she has to give the uh, the uh, the do on the because there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet asked women that were wearing jewelry that did you give zakat on this jewelry? 
However, other uh, fuqaha like Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, on jewelry that you wear on day-to-day -day basis, they say you do not have to give zakat on jewelry that's like an everyday wearing uh, thing. And the dalil for that is another hadith in which uh, some of the orphans that Asma was raising, they used to wear jewelry and they did, and that, whose value was more than Nisab and they did not uh, uh, give zakat on that. Anyway, uh, another thing is that loans are of two types. Let me just mention this point, inshallah, we can end. Because I do, I actually wanted one, but I probably need like two, three hours to actually give a proper uh, detailing of everything about zakat. But loans are of two types, you can say. And I'm saying this in a new way, uh, rather than our traditional way, but the end result is the same. There is the loans that you can say have fixed periods. And loans that are part of your, uh, like for example, you, you bought a car. And you're, you can't say, well, I bought a car and I have to give $50,000 for it. I'm giving $300. So therefore, I'm not going to give it to You can't do that. Money that has a fixed time period or money that is, it's, under, it's like part of your, like giving rent, for example. It's part of your, uh, uh, your usual. It's, it is a, that is different from a personal loan that you own. So a personal loan that you own and that is due and you have to give debt on that, that will be taken out from your total assets and see if it meets Nisab or not. But if it is like you bought a building and you're paying for it, you bought a car and you're paying for it. And even for Hajj, you can't say I can't go to Hajj because I have a loan. Uh, inshallah after Salah. If you can't, you cannot say, well, I'm not going to go to Hajj because I have this debt because I have four cars and I'm paying the, uh, the monthly fees on that. No, that's your everyday process it is it has a certain term and it's understood and it's part of your monthly expenses so it's not, you will not take cannot, you cannot make that as an excuse an excuse for not going to hajj or paying zakat sorry i'm trying to talk fast and losing words here inshallah let's uh, end with dua and we will pray so uh let me know if you want to hear more about the issue of paper money and the, uh, the issues of Islamic law and Muslims and our baqa, our istikbar, our tamakkun in America, uh, how the two are interrelated. And you know, religious, and by the way, I wanted to mention this churches are already doing this. Churches are already preparing. You know, churches, you know, when, if, if, God forbid, if everything was to collapse, the only things that would remain right now, would be the religious communities, would be the synagogues and the churches and the masjids. And everyone of that that is attached to a mosque would have, well, that's where they're going to go, because that's where the community is. But Christians are, are already looking into buying gold and silver, not just at an individual level, but they're already looking at, you know, just in case, they're, they're not only buying gold and silver, they're buying like, dry foods and all sorts of things. And I'm sure many of you have seen maybe ads of this nature that where they're selling this stuff. But it is something that we need to take serious because uh, because uh, it is from Quran and Sunnah it's quite obvious in the direction that we are headed in. Inshallah اللهم تجعل القرآن ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا اللهم ارزقنا تلاوته آناء الليل وأطراف النهار اللهم تقبل صيامنا وقيامنا اللهم آمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد before you stand up and before I say إن الله يعمل من أجل والإحسان I want to make a few announcements and uh, and as I do that, then inshallah we will stand up for prayers. And then there will be a brother coming up. Please do give him your full attention and your focus. And uh, number one, uh, okay, so the announcements are, uh, do not forget to do Eid, uh, give your Eid, which is $10 per person, which should be given before Eid. Uh, after Salah, we need help setting up tables for today's uh, people coming, if some volunteers can help set up tables. Uh, June 11th uh, is the open house. I personally know uh, maybe about 10 people that will be coming. 
July 11th, sorry. Uh, there will be uh, many non-Muslims coming, so if you have non-Muslim friends in your businesses, in your, uh, you know, in your, in your neighbors, bring them here and int let's introduce them to the Muslim community at the very least, and if possible, uh, even Islam. Uh, the Hajjud, we will be starting the Hajjud, I think starting Monday, uh, starting at 3 o'clock. Itikaf, if you're planning to do the 10 day Itikaf, or even a partial Itikaf, let me know. Uh, that will help, I believe, in the logistics of how things will go. Eid is on Friday, July 17th at Ridgeland Ballroom at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, uh, yes, and also if you made any pledges, uh, please uh, help with that. And then also your pledges for the Burmese uh, Muslims uh, and, and, and giving funds to the Bur Burmese Muslims, inshallah. So and inshallah, I, I do think that Muslims will generally, generously donate for that. Inna Allah